have revealed something really quite startling to us. Something we call the impact bias, which is the tendency for the simulator to work badly. For the simulator to make you believe that different outcomes are more different than the fact they really are. From field studies to laboratory studies, we see that winning or losing an election, gaining or losing a romantic partner, getting or not getting a promotion, passing or not passing a college test, on and on, have far less impact, less intensity, and much less duration than people expect them to have. In fact, a recent study, this almost floors me, a recent study showing how uh, major life traumas affect people suggests that if it happened over three months ago with only a few exceptions, it has no impact whatsoever on your happiness. Why? Because happiness can be synthesized. Sir Thomas Brown wrote in 1642, I am the happiest man alive. I have that in me that can convert poverty to riches, adversity to prosperity. I am more invulnerable than Achilles' fortune hath not one place to hit me. What kind of remarkable machinery does this guy have in his head? Well, it turns out it's precisely the same remarkable machinery that all of us have. Human beings have something that we might think of as a psychological immune system, a system of cognitive processes, largely non-conscious cognitive processes, that help them change their views of the world so that they can feel better about the worlds in which they find themselves. Like Sir Thomas, you have this machine, and unlike Sir Thomas, you seem not to know it. We synthesize happiness, but we think happiness is a thing to be found. Now, you don't need me to tell you, give you too many examples of people synthesizing happiness, I suspect. But I'm going to show you some experimental evidence. You don't have to look very far for evidence. I, as a challenge to myself, since I say this once in a while in lectures, I took a copy of the New York Times and tried to find some instances of people synthesizing happiness. And here are three guys synthesizing happiness. I'm so much better off physically, financially, emotionally, in almost every other way, mentally, almost every other way. I don't want them to regret. It was a glorious experience. I believe it turned out for the best. Who are these characters who are so damn happy? Well, the first one is Jim Wright. Some of you old enough to remember, he was the chairman of the House of Representatives. And uh, he resigned in disgrace when this young Republican named Newt Gingrich found out about Shady Book he had done. He lost everything. Most powerful Democrat in the country lost everything. He lost his money, he lost his power. What does he have to say all these years later about it? I am so much better off physically, financially, mentally, in almost every other way. What other way would there be to be better off? Vegetably, minerally, animally? He's pretty much covered in there. The race victim is somebody you've never heard of. The race victim uttered these words. Upon being released, he was 78 years old, spent 37 years in the Louisiana State Penitentiary for crime he didn't commit. He was ultimately exonerated at the age of 78 through DNA evidence. And what do you have to say about this story? If I don't have one minute to regret it, it's a glorious experience. Glorious! This guy is not saying, well, yeah, there's some nice guy, I've been a gym. It's glorious! A word we usually reserve for something like a religious experience. Harriet Langerman uttered these words, and he's somebody you might have known but didn't. He was in 1949, he read a little article in the paper about a hamburger stand owned by these two brothers named McDonald's. And he thought, that's a really neat idea. So he went to find them. They said, we gave you a franchise on this for 3000 bucks." Harry went back to New York, asked his brother, who was an investment banker, for one of the $3,000, and his brothers in more awards were, you would eat nobody eats hamburgers. He would have landed the money, and of course, six months later, Ray Kroc had exactly the same idea. It turns out people do eat hamburgers, and Ray Kroc, for a while, became the richest man in America. Oh, and then finally, you know, the best of all possible worlds. Some of you recognize this young photo of Pete Best, who was the original drummer for the Beatles. Until they, you know, kind of like sent him out on an errand and snuck away, who kept up Ringo on a tour. Well, in 1994, when Pete Best was interviewed, yes, he's still a drummer, yes, he's a studio musician. He needs to say, I'm happier than I would have been with the Beatles. Okay, there's something important to be learned from these people, and it is the secret of happiness. Here it is, finally, to be revealed. First, a crew will power and prestige and lose. Second, spend as much of your life in prison as you possibly can. Third, make somebody else really, really rich. And finally, never, ever join the Beatles. Okay, now, I like to be frank to predict your next thought, which is, yeah, right. Because when people synthesize happiness, as these gentlemen seem to have done, we all smile at them, but we kind of roll our eyes and say, yeah, 
yeah, right. We didn't have a friend who wanted the job. Oh, yeah, we're right. She, we really didn't have that much in common with her, and we figured that out just about the time she threw the engagement ring in your face. We smirk because we believe that synthetic happiness is not of the same quality as what we might call natural happiness. What are these terms? Natural happiness is what we get when we get what we wanted, and synthetic happiness is what we make when we don't get what we wanted. In our society, we have a strong belief that synthetic happiness is of an inferior kind. Why do we have that belief? Well, it's very simple. What kind of economic engine would keep churning if we believe that not getting what we want could make us just as happy as getting it? With all apologies to my friend Matthew Ricard, a shopping mall full of Zen monks is not going to be particularly profitable because they don't want stuff enough. I want to suggest to you that synthetic happiness is every bit as real and enduring as the kind of happiness you stumble upon when you get exactly what you were aiming for. Now, I'm saying this, so I'm going to do this out with rhetoric, but by marrying you with a little bit of data. Let me first show you an experimental paradigm that is used to demonstrate the synthesis of happiness among regular old folks. This isn't mine, but a 50-year-old paradigm called the free choice paradigm. It's very simple. You bring in, say, six objects, and you ask the subject to rank them from the most to the least liked. In this case, because the experiment is going to tell you about uses them, these are Monet prints. So everybody can rank these Monet prints from the one they like the most to the one they like the least. Now that we give you a choice, we happen to have some extra prints in the closet, and we're going to give you one as your prize to take home. We happen to have number three and number four, we tell the subject. This is a bit of a difficult choice, because neither one is preferred strongly to the other, but naturally, people tend to pick number three, because they like them a little better than number four. Sometime later, it could be 15 minutes, it could be 15 days, the same stimulator put before the subject, and the subject is asked to rewrite the stimulator. Tell us how much you like them now. What happens? Watch as happiness is synthesized. This is the result that has been replicated over and over again. You're watching happiness be synthesized. Would you like to see it again? Happiness! The one I got is really better than I thought. The other one I didn't get sucks. That's the synthesis of happiness. Now, what's the right response to that? Yeah, right. Now, here's the experiment we did, and I hope this is going to convince you that yeah, right was not the right response. We did this experiment with a group of patients who had inter-grade amnesia. These are hospitalized patients. Most of them have Korsakoff syndrome, a polyneurotic psychosis that they, they drank way too much and they can't make new memories. Hey, they remember their childhood, but if you walk in and introduce yourself and then leave the room, when you come back, they don't know who you are. We took our Monet prints to the hospital and we asked these patients to rank them from the one they liked the most to the one they liked the least. We then gave them the choice between number three and number four. Like everybody else, they said, gee, thanks, Doc, that's great. I can use a new print. I'll take number three. We explained we would have number three mailed to them. We gathered up our materials, and we went out of the room and counted to a half hour. Back into the room. We say, hi, we're back. The patients bless them, say, Oh, God, I'm sorry, I've got no memory problems when I'm here. If I've met before, I don't remember. Really, Jim, you don't remember? I was just here with the Monet Prince. Sorry, Doc, I just don't have a clue. No problem, Jim. All I want you to do is rank these for me from the one they like the most to the one they like the least. What do they do? Well, let's first check and make sure they're really amnesia. We ask these amnesia patients to tell us which one they own. Which one they chose last time? Which one is theirs? And what we find is, how many patients just guess? Because in normal controls, if I did this with you, all of you would know which print you chose. But if I do this with amnesia patients, they don't have a clue. They can't pick their print out of the lineup. Here's what normal controls do. They synthesize happiness, right? This is the change in liking score. The change from the first time they rank to the second time they rank. Normal controls show that the magic I showed you. Now I'm showing it to you in graphical form. The one I own is better than I thought. The one I didn't own, the one I left behind, is not as good as I thought. And we just do exactly the same thing. Think about this result. These people like better the one they own, but they don't know they own it. 
Yeah, right, and not the right response. The things people did when they synthesized happiness is they really, truly changed their affective, hedonic, aesthetic reactions to that poster. They're not just taking it because they own it, because they don't know they own it. Now, when psychologists show you bars, you know that they are showing you averages of lots of people. And yet, all of us have this psychological immune system, this capacity to synthesize happiness, but some of us do this trick better than others. And some situations allow anybody to do it more effectively than other situations do. It turns out that freedom, the ability to make up your mind and change your mind, is the friend of natural happiness, because it allows you to choose among all those delicious futures. That if I'm the one that you most enjoy, but freedom to choose, to change and make up your mind, is the enemy of synthetic happiness. And I'm going to show you why. Gilbert already knows, of course. We're reading the cartoon as I'm talking. Gilbert's tech support, how may I abuse you? My printer prints a blank page after every document. Why do you complain about getting free paper? Free, even if I'm just doing my own paper? Hey, Dad, now look at the quality of the free paper. Very good, lousy way of looking. Only four liars would say that they look the same. Now that you mentioned it, it does seem a little severe. What are you doing? I'm helping people accept the things that cannot change. Indeed. The psychological immune system works best when we are totally stuck, when we are trapped. This is, this is the difference from dating in marriage, right? I mean, you go out on a date with a guy, he picks his nose, you go out on another date. You marry with a guy, he picks his nose, he doesn't get the heart of all the blood pressure, but we did, right? You find a way to be happy with what's happening. Now, what I want to show you is that people don't know this about themselves, and not knowing this can work to our supreme disadvantage. Here's an experiment we did at Harvard. We created a photography course, a black and white photography course, and we allowed students to come in and learn how to use a dark room. So we gave them cameras, they went on campus, they took 12 pictures of their favorite professors in their dorm room and their, you know, their dog and all the other things they wanted to have 100 memories of. They bring us the camera, we make up a contact sheet, they figure out which of the two best pictures, and we now spend six hours teaching them about dark rooms, and they blow two of them up, and they have two, four, six, eight, by ten glossies of meaningful things, but then we say, which one would you like to give up? <laughs> I can give one up. Oh, yes, we need one as evidence of the class project. So you have to give me one, you have to make a choice, you get to keep one, and I get to keep one. Now, there are two conditions in this experiment. In one case, the students are told, well, you know, if you want to change your mind, always have the other one here, and in the next four days before I actually mail it to headquarters, I'll be glad to get headquarters. I'll be glad to swap it out with you. In fact, I'll come to your dorm room with you. Just give me an email there, and I'll check with you. If you ever want to change your mind, it's totally in return. The other half of the students are told exactly the opposite. Make your choice, and by the way, the mail is going out of gosh, in two minutes to England, your picture will be waiting this way over the Atlantic, and you will never see it again. Now, half of the students in each of these conditions are asked to make predictions about how much they're going to come to like the picture that they keep and the picture that they leave behind. Other students are just sent back to their little warm rooms, and they are measured over the next uh, six to three to six days on their liking, satisfaction with the pictures. Look at what we find. First of all, here's what students think is going to happen. They think they're going to maybe come to like the picture they chose a little more than the one they left behind, but these are not statistically significant differences. It really is a very small increase, and it doesn't much matter whether they were in the reversible or irreversible condition. Wrong, though. Bad simulators. Because here's what's really happening. Go right before the swap and five days later. People who are stuck with that picture, who have no choice, who can never change their mind, like it a lot. And people who are deliberating, should I turn up? I got the right one. Maybe this isn't the good one. Maybe I like the good one. Have killed themselves. They don't like their picture. And in fact, even after the opportunity to swap has expired, they still don't like their picture. Why? Because the irreversible condition is not conducive to the synthesis of happiness. So here's the final piece of this experiment. We bring in a whole new group of naive Harvard students, and we said, you know, we're doing a photography course, and we can do it one of two ways. 
We can do it so that when you take the two pictures, you have four days to change your mind. Oh, we're doing another course where you take the two pictures and you have to mind right away and never change it. Which course would you like to be in? Duh. 66% of the students, two-thirds, prefer to be in the course where they have the opportunity to change their mind. Hello? 66% of the students choose to be in a course in which they will ultimately be deeply dissatisfied with the picture. Because they do not know the conditions under which synthetic happiness grows. The Bard said everything best, of course, and he's making my point here but he's making it hyperbolically. There's nothing good or bad, but thinking makes it so. It's nice poetry, but that can't exactly be right. Is there really nothing good or bad? Is it really the case that gallbladder surgery and a trip to Paris are just the same thing? Nah, that seems like a one question IQ test. It can't be exactly the same. In more turgid prose, but closer to the truth, was the father of modern capitalism, Adam Smith, and he said this. This is worth contemplating. The great source of both the misery and disorders of human life seems to arise from overrating the difference between one permanent situation and another. Some of these situations may no doubt deserve to be preferred to others, but none of them can be deserved, none of them can deserve to be pursued with that passionate ardor which drives us to violate the rules either of prudence or of justice, or to corrupt the future tranquility of our minds either by shame from the remembrance of our own folly or by remorse for the horror of our own injustice. In other words, yes, some things are better than others. We should have preferences that lead us into one future over another. But when those preferences drive us too hard and too fast because we have overrated the difference between these futures, we are at risk. When our ambition is bounded, it leads us to work joyfully. When our ambition is unbounded, it leads us to lie, to cheat, to steal, to hurt others, to sacrifice things of real value. When our fears are bounded, we're prudent, we're cautious, we're thoughtful. When our fears are unbounded and overblown, we're reckless and we're cowardly. The lesson I want to leave you with from these data is that our longings and our worries are both to some degree overblown because we have within us the capacity to manufacture the very commodity we are constantly chasing when we choose experience. Thank you. So what we saw there was a Harvard psychologist telling us certain things. If some of you couldn't follow that, I just point out certain things from this talk. Happiness, though he prefers to call some kind of happiness, synthetic happiness, what he essentially says based on some experiments, he says that happiness, real happiness and synthetic happiness like we know in the case of grapes are sour because you couldn't get the grapes they are sour both are one and the same there's no difference there is no difference but why do we feel the difference because our society says so because your friend tells so because your spouse says so you want to excel always because you are taught that way and one important reason the economy wants so as two of you objected that what will happen if nobody has any motivation yes economy wants you to be constantly motivated so that there could be production that's one important reason why you want to be happy but as he quoted Adam Smith no happiness or no pursuit or no passion can be so very important so as to compromise your peace of mind. What is more important is your harmonious life, your holistic living. You be in one piece, not that you be shattered to pieces because you are pursuing some particular happiness. And there was an example that one man couldn't achieve what he couldn't 
and then he said that you can't get whatever you want and then there is the image of Bill Gates who says yes you can but essentially Bill Gates and person who failed both achieve the same kind of happiness only thing is the perception of that happiness is different they think that they have failed and this fellow thinks that he has succeeded because if you see either physically or spiritually there's not much a difference you don't actually need you may have 20,000 cars but given at a point of time you're going to ride only one one so you don't need that kind of opulence or that kind of what you call prosperity you don't need that but most of the times we spend our lives fussing about what we couldn't achieve than concentrating what we have at hand and that is why I thought that we should understand because you see most of the times when a monk tells you says oh this fellow has no other work he just goes on giving lecturing but it's not my thing or when you read some scripture it's oh some old superstition a Harvard psychologist has that opinion so there is something called happiness but this happiness is a pure imagination of your mind there is no absolute happiness that can never be and that's what we have to understand you see the experiment involving amnesia patients half an hour afterwards they couldn't remember which photograph they selected which print they selected but unknowingly they selected the same print when they were asked to rank it because it was hardwired into the system the brain knows so it's physically there in your system that you know what you had actually ranked so the synthesis of happiness is something very physical than we believe it's not that psychological as we think so no need to struggle so much to be happy because you're already happy you see if I bring Vedanta then it will say that you are always free souls you don't need to worry about that happiness is an external constraint you impose upon yourself No, no, synthetic happiness, that is what he terms it, but actually that also, also comes to you naturally, through your brain. You don't need any training to be happy. They get depressed because they perceive that they are unhappy. That's what I'm coming to. You see, I have a salary of 30,000 rupees, say, but I am unhappy because I see a person who is drawing 60,000 rupees. As it is, my salary is okay. Because you have a comparison. Again, they gave an example that when a person was asked that you have this photograph, but you can after three days come and exchange, they couldn't make up their mind till last which one they wanted. And they were always unhappy. They thought, oh, that was better. See, now what happens in TV channel? Earlier we had only one channel, that Doordarshan. We were all happy. Now 400 channels we are not happy. No person can stand in one channel for more than 5 minutes. Channel surfing. Because we have so many options, you can't be happy. Because you think the one is somehow better than the other. You think so. It's not true. No, that's what he, he told there, is synthetic happiness real? Yes, it is real. There is no difference between synthetic happiness and real happiness because physiologically, the process is same. What happens in your brain when you become happy, synthetically or otherwise is same. Only you perceive that I am not happy because I am not achieved. But there is no difference. No, because you are expecting. Bec in the first place, when you left the parents, 
No, in the first place when you, that's what Adam Smith again says that, when the first place when you left their parents, you also carry a regret with you that I have neglected my parents. That brings some thought. But yeah. at the same time that brings some happiness that they might be alive after such years. No, that is what you perceive. It all depends on your perception. Suppose you, uh, somebody who is, uh, uh, see this is more hypothetical, somebody leaves the parents, more because he got into some accident and forgot everything, not complete amnesia. That fellow will not have any problem. 